Let someone shout hallelujah. Someone said the first sign that someone is sick is loss of appetite. When someone finds it difficult to eat, particularly something he used to enjoy to eat. So he went further to say, one of the signs that a Christian is spiritually sick is when they find it difficult to worship God. I don't know how many sick people are here tonight. I, know, I don't know how many people are spiritually well. If you are one of those who are spiritually well, maybe by the time you finish praising God, through your worship of God, the fellow is spiritually sick, might be made whole. So beginning from now, when you find it difficult to praise God the way you ought to, you should check yourself. From the testimonies we've had tonight, even if it's only that of the man who had been mad for 20 years, who got a hand beam and got healed without anybody praying for him. I was uncomfortable on my seat. When, when we hear all these marvelous testimonies and they don't seem to move us anymore, are we well? I'm going to give the few of us who are still healthy to help those who might be sick. For the next five minutes, before we do any other thing, for the next five minutes, let's give glory to this God, this almighty God, this King of kings, this Lord of lords, this I am that I am, this ancient of this, this God who can do wonders, this God who is proving himself again and again and again in our midst, this God who brought you into the new year, this God who said no to those who said you will not see the new year, this God who has been fighting your battles for you. Oh, let's praise him. Let's give him glory. Let's give him honor. Let's give him adoration. Let's magnify his holy name. Praise him like we've never done before. Give him glory. He has done so much for each and every one of us. We can't tell it all. Give him glory. Give him glory. Give him glory. Give him honor. Give him adoration. Bless his holy name. Oh, what a wonderful God you are. What a wonderful God you are. What a wonderful God you are. Blessed be your holy name. Blessed be your holy name. Blessed, blessed, blessed be your holy name, Lord. Glory be to your name forever and ever. Forever and ever. We praise you, Lord. Ancient of this, we praise you. I give you glory, I give you honor, I give you adoration, I praise you. You are worthy to be praised, Lord. You are worthy to be magnified. 
worthy to be adored, Lord. What a God! What a mighty God you are! Oh my God! Blessed be your holy name. 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 Rakunshe de remo ko, runde ke remo ko, shutun drama hakashata. Kekendre remo ko, runde remo ko, shikanto remo ko, shutun drama hakashata. Oh, thank you, Father. Glory be to God. Remo ko shinde remo ka, keke rende ke remo ko shata. I praise you, Lord. I magnify your holy name. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Almighty God. Thank you, Jesus. Glory be to your holy name. Blessed be your holy name. Blessed be your holy name, Lord. Blessed be your holy name, Lord. Thank you, Daddy. Thank you, ancient of days. Blessed, blessed, blessed be your holy name. Thank you, Almighty God. Remo ko sheke kendre remo ko runde ke remo ka shato de remo ko shota. Thank you, Father. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Oh, thank you, my Savior. Thank you, my Savior. Thank you, my Savior. Thank you, my Savior. Thank you, Lord. In your mighty name, we have worshipped. Please be seated for a moment. It's a Holy Ghost service. And in a Holy Ghost service, we allow the Holy Ghost to do whatever He wants to do. Oh, thank you, my daddy. You know, one of the greatest sins that can ever be committed is the sin of ingratitude. That was the, that was the cause of the original sin. God created man. Before he created him, he planted a garden and put everything there. He just woke up to find that there's abundance everywhere. And God said to him, everything you see here is yours. So only one tree I don't want you to touch. That's the tree of good and evil. When the tempter came, he said to the woman, forget all the things, all, everything he had given you. Just focus on that one thing you can't have. Don't be grateful for the rest. You know the rest of the story. If I have my way, we will just spend tonight just thanking God. Because he is more than worthy to be praised. I'll tell you one or two things. You may see end up doing it exactly like that. After all, the theme for next uh, Holy Ghost service in February is let there be light. Part two. As I've told you, some of you, you've had the story before, maybe you forgot. 
story of a very wealthy man. The kind of person that was a great socialite. Until he arrives, the party has not started. Full of wit and humor. And, and then he had a stroke. The, the kind of stroke that takes away a man's voice. Because he was wealthy, they took him to the best hospital in London. And I was just visiting London, and there was this man who is a friend of both of us. He's, he's my friend and his friend. I said, ah, Daddy, thank God you are here. My friend is in a very serious situation. Will you please come and pray for him? So I said, fine. So we went to the hospital. When we got to the hospital, because he was a wealthy man, he got a room out to himself, big room, all the comfort. Oh. You know, you can have all the money in the world and still suffer. And those of us who don't have money, but we can eat. Our house is not a mansion, but we can sleep. Anybody like that here? Let me hear you shout hallelujah. When we arrived, he was sitting up in bed. They have to help him to sit up. And his wife was sitting by his side. As soon as we arrived, apparently the wife wanted to go and get something for him. The wife greeted us and left. A few minutes after we've been there, after I've prayed, and he tried to communicate. He patted the place where the wife was sitting, pointed in the direction the wife went, and signal back to himself. So my friend and I we were trying to interpret what he said. You want us to go and call your wife? Uh-uh. She parted where he was sitting again. Oh, you want you want your friend to come and sit next to you? Uh-uh. You want the pastor, me, to come and sit next to you? Uh-uh. After 30 minutes of sweating, we understood that what he was saying is, my wife, who went away, is coming back. 30 minutes. By now he was sweating. He was... Here you are, here you are. You can talk, you can fail, you can shout. When we ask you to praise God, it is difficult for you. You can't praise the Almighty, the one who has given you a mouth to speak. Ah, come on, brethren, let's praise Him. Let's praise him. Let's give him glory. He deserves it. He deserves it. He deserves it. He gives you the mouth so you can sing his praise. He gives you hands that are simple by. You are still alive, 
And he says, all those who have bread should praise him. And you are still breathing. Why don't you praise him? Why don't you praise him? Why don't you give him glory? And give him honor? And give him adoration? Why don't you praise him? Thank you, my father. Oh. You're worthy. You're worthy of my praise. You're my savior. You're my healer. You're my protector. My provider. But the one who baptized me with the Holy Ghost and with fire, why won't I praise you? Why won't I praise you? If I'm alive today, it's because of you. It's because of your mercy. Oh Lord, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, my Lord and my Savior. Glory be to your holy name. If you are not being on my side, what will I be saying now? Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Glory be to your holy name. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name we worship. Sit down again, please. I just want to help you. I want to help you, praise him. And the Bible says, if God has not been on our side, <laughs> when men rose up against us, they would have swallowed us. They would have swallowed us. You don't know all the battles that God has fought for you. When you are lying down helplessly asleep, you don't know it. You don't know it. I've told you the story before, not too long ago, of a man who brought a daughter all the way from Eloni and said, Daddy, I need help. What's the problem? The daughter told the father, Daddy, she said, I belong to a court of witches. The father said, what, are you, what nonsense are you talking about? Where do you get that nonsense from? The girl said, I'm not talking nonsense. Telling you the truth. You want proof? He went under the bed and brought out a pot full of fresh human blood. This is not fables. I'm telling you true story. Father packed the girl into the car, brought her here, and uh, we did deliverance for the girl. And then I said, you can go. The father said, no, 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 let the girl stay with you. I said, now you want to abandon the girl with me? If God has not been on your side, all the days, You'll be sleeping with that child. Will you be here today? Do you know who you are sleeping with? Do you know how many of them are in your homes? Do you know who is the closest ally of Satan? Going in and out with you. How many wolves? that are in sheep clothing 
that are living with you, working with you in the office. I'll give you one other example. So you, because we need to praise him, I think we are guilty. We are guilty of ingratitude. Maybe, maybe he's sending his light to open our eyes to our errors. I told you, true story. We've had it before, not making it up. I was at the University of Illinois as a teacher. We have a house over there. In those days, there was no traffic in Illinois. You can go from one end of the town to another in 15 minutes. So I will come from the university, come to the house to take lunch. I did not do that when I was in the University of Lagos. And this afternoon, I've eaten, I've taken my lunch. My next lecture for my students, I think, is going to be around 4 p.m. or 5 p.m. So I decided to relax a little before I go back to the campus. And I laid on the couch in the living room. And because I was pastoring the church in Lorraine at that time, people come in and out of our house so that they won't disturb me so I could rest. I closed my eyes so that if they come in, they will think I'm sleeping. In all of a sudden, I felt a hand holding my two legs, another hand, because I put my hands together as a pillow, another hand holding my two hands, and I felt as if something is about to kiss me. And I felt, wait a minute, that can be my wife. She won't be kissing me in the living room because anybody could come in any time. And then I realized, whoever can put one hand to hold my legs and put one hand to hold my hand must be a very huge fellow. So I opened my eyes suddenly and the thing disappeared. That day, I nearly died. And when I cried to God, Father, how can this happen to me? I'm your child. How can a demon like this come into my house? My house is under your protection. You know what he said to me? I just want to show you one of the battles I've been fighting for you that you don't know anything about. Will you stand on your feet and praise the almighty God who has been fighting your battles, who has been defending you? Do you think it is your cleverness that you are still alive? Do you think it is because you know how to pray? Do you think it is your anointing that is so mighty that the enemy had not swallowed you up? If God has not been on our side, where will we be now? Where shall we be now? If God has not been fighting our battles for us, how many times do you know when you have eaten poison and the poison didn't work? How many times do you know when the enemy had come in the night with the intention of making sure you don't see the following morning? Praise him. Let him hear your voice. Give him glory. Give him adoration. Don't be too proud to praise the Almighty God. He is worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy to be praised. He's worthy to be praised. Oh. <laughs> give him glory. Give him honor. Give him adoration. Bless his holy name. Bless his holy name. Thank you, my Father. Thank you, Father. In J.
Jesus mighty name we worship you are worthy oh Lord you are worthy you are worthy to be glorified you are worthy oh Lord you are worthy you are worthy to be glorified hallelujah you are worthy oh lord you are worthy you are worthy to be glorified you are worthy my lord you are worthy you are worthy Hallelujah, you are worthy, my Lord, you are worthy, you are worthy to be glorified, you are worthy, my Lord, you are worthy, you are worthy. you are worthy you are worthy to be glorified Alpha and Omega you are worthy King of Kings and Lord of Lords you are worthy thank you for all you did last year thank you for keeping us alive to see today thank you for what you have been doing even since January 1 there were many people who shouted Happy New Year who are no more now Thank you for your love. Thank you for your protection. Thank you for every blessing, Lord. Please accept our worship in Jesus' name. Tonight, the way you alone can do it, let there be light. In all our lives, let there be light. In all our homes, let there be light. In all your churches, let there be light. In all our nations, let there be light. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. And let someone shout hallelujah. I look for two or three people you have not seen this year. Shake hands with them and say, Happy New Year to you. And then you may please be seated. With the exception of those who are January children. If you are born in January, let me hear you shout hallelujah. <laughs> Father, I'm committing all your children born in the month of January into your hands. January, the first month of the year. I pray, Lord God Almighty, that all these your children will be first. that will give them priority. That in every area of their lives, my Father and my God, you will consider them first. Give them a brand new beginning, a new beginning of joy, of success, of gratitude, of a closer walk with you. Just let it be well with them, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Well, children of January, shout hallelujah. And then there, there, there's uh, a group of very special people that I want to pray for tonight. Uh, they are the people working in Julius Badger. 
So if you are a worker in Julius Bagley, I, I think you should step forward now. I would love to pray for you. I want to thank God for, for your lives, for what He has been using you to do. And then we need to pray for you for special anointing so that uh, you will finish the work on the expressway in time. So if you walk with Julius Berger, please step forward. Let's clap for them as they come. Uh, wonderful people. They just there, right there at the, at the altar down there. At the altar down there, yes. Please, uh, I want everybody to help me stretch your hands towards them. Pray for them, wish them well, pray that God will give them wisdom, give them understanding, give them very special ability, that God will anoint them for success, for speed in the execution of their projects, particularly the Lagos by the Expressway project. And that miraculously, this project will be completed this year. Pray for them. Please pray with all your heart. They need divine intervention in their lives. Oh, thank you, my Father. Glory be to your holy name. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Father, I'm praying especially for these, your children, who are workers in the Julius Berger of Nigeria. I pray that you will bless them. You will cause them to prosper. That you will anoint them for greater success. Anoint them for speed. Help them like nobody else can. Lord, in your own miraculous way, help them to finish particularly this project from Lagos to Ibadan within this year. Father, I'm praying that by this time next year, we will be thanking you for the success of this group of people in Jesus' name. Thank you, my Father and my God. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Now, let, God bless you. You may go back to your seat. Let every one of us give the Lord a big round of applause for these wonderful people. Thank you, Father. Now, I've already told you that by the grace of God, the theme for next uh, Holy Ghost service in February is Let There Be Light, Part 2. Um, I also want to inform you that uh, our fasting begins January 11. You are not excited. <laughs> and this time, the first installment of our fasting will be for 50 days only. That means you start from January 11 and you end uh, February 29. Those 50 days only. And um, as usual, if you are already over 70, except you are the general overseer, you are exempted. If you are 70 and above, you are exempted because at the age of 70, your prayer to heaven is a short distance call. If you are already over 80, <laughs> your own call is a local call. 
So, there, so there's no need for you to fast. Uh, God will answer your prayers quickly. The rest of us who fast, as I've always advised you, during fasting, the, it becomes very easy if you learn to keep your mouth shut. Um, if you want to talk at all, you should be talking to God. When you are fasting, talking takes a lot of energy. So anything you don't have to talk about, you don't talk about it at all. And as usual, if you want to do everything together, you want to do some continuous fasting so that you can get it out of the way, if you can fast for 21 days a night continuously, that will take care of the 50 days. Right. Now, let's go to the Word of God. Um, if I don't finish what I planned, we will pick it up from there next month. In the meantime, let us put our hands together for the two boys who had ministered before us. Um, a pastor came first and, and told us that uh, the word of God does not need a visa. Once God speaks, the manifestation will follow. We thank God for that because once he spoke, it is done. Uh, the second gentleman spoke like an evangelist and gave us several titles. I was spitting the interpreter. I wonder how he was interpreting all those titles. And uh, <laughs> even I don't know the meaning of uh, John Paulistic, uh, hallelujah. <laughs> and the Rabaristic. And there was the shaky shaky one. <laughs> Let's give the Lord a big round of applause. We, we have this wonderful, wonderful children. We are blessed. Amen. Genesis chapter 1. I'll be reading my own from verse 1 to 5. I know they read their own from verse 1 to 3. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Now, um, permit me to break just briefly. There's a very important announcement I forgot, and that is all over the camp, there are angels of God watching over us. I'm sure you must have realized that by now. But then, because uh, the world is also progressing, uh, so we wanted to take advantage of technology. I, I have been told that it, it is uh, a legal requirement that we let you know that the camp is covered from corner to corner by CCTV. so that as you are entering the camp, every car coming in is being recorded with their plate numbers. Uh, in all those corners where you think uh, maybe the place is dark and you think you can fool around, there's a camera there watching you. Um, and <laughs> some very funny things had happened since this CCTV came into operation. I'm not allowed to tell you where their headquarters is, but they have an headquarters, a building where they monitor everything. 
they, they took me there when I was going to pray over the place and they showed me some of the things that they had achieved. There was a man who went to the old arena and there's a box there where people drop uh, offerings or whatever and the man looked around and there was nobody. So he, he opened the box and took some of the envelopes and began to stuff them into his pocket. But unknown to him, everything he was doing was already being shown. So just one phone call from the headquarters to some motorcyclists around, and just before he could move too fast, they caught him. And said, what, what's the problem? Uh, they said, nothing, sir. We just want to see what is in your pocket. And some of the envelopes had tight. Some of the envelopes had false fruit. Some, so, <laughs> some of, and the writings were many. So he couldn't, he couldn't say much more. Then they showed me another one. The, the, there was a car parked somewhere. And there was this fellow who was walking past, but all of a sudden, they saw the way he was looking. Looking right, looking left. And when he thought there was nobody watching him, he put his hand into the car and was about to take something out of the car. Uh, I think he took one or two things, but he wanted more. Before he could bring out his hand the third time, he was arrested. So I, I just want you to know, they said, I must tell you, they said that's a legal requirement. Uh, the camp is not what it used to be. Uh, <laughs> there is light. Uh, and the cameras are those kind of cameras that can see in the dark. So whether it is during the day or during the night, if you are doing what you are not supposed to be doing on the camp, there is a record going on, just as is going on in heaven. Now, let somebody shout, let there be light. <laughs> let, let me talk briefly to those who are yet to surrender their life to Jesus and explain what does it mean when we say let there be light. You see, let there be light can be a command. It can also be an advice. And number three, it can be a plea, a begging, a request. When God is speaking and he says, let there be light, it could be a command. Like in Genesis chapter 1 here, verse 3. When God said, let there be light, he wasn't begging. And he wasn't advising, he was commanding. But he could also be advising. Let there be light. But God never begs. So when you hear, let there be light, as far as the begging aspect or the plea aspect is concerned, it is from man to God. Now to those of you who had not given your life to Jesus Christ, let there be light is coming from God to you as an advice. He's saying, according to Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, Revelation 3, verse 20, he said, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If you hear my voice and you open the door, I will come in. 
He's advising you, let light come in. Because one of the boys who spoke before us defined light as God. He said God is light and light is God. So when God says, let me come in, he's saying, let light come in. And he's advising you to let light come in because he says, if I come in, if you open the door to me to come in, I will not come in empty-handed. James chapter 1 verse 17. James chapter 1 verse 17. It tells us that every good and every perfect gift will come from God. From the Father of lights. If you allow me to come in, I will come in with good gifts, with perfect gifts. When you open the door to God to come in, he will not come in empty-handed. If you allow him to come in, darkness will go out, you allow him to come in, for example, failure will go out. Luke chapter 5, verse 1 to 7. Luke 5, from verse 1 to 7. Peter had fished all night, all night, and caught nothing. But the moment Jesus stepped into his boat, failure jumped out. Because when light comes in, failure must go out. He says, if you let me come in, if you open the door of your heart to me, and you let me come in, you begin to succeed. Philippians chapter 4 verse 13. Philippians 4 13 says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. If I can, if you open the door of your heart to the light of God and it comes in, suddenly you begin to succeed. He says, if you allow me to come in, all of a sudden you find that your needs will be met. Philippians 4.19. Philippians 4.19 says, but my God shall supply all your needs, not some, all of your needs, according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus, if you, if you allow me to come in. He said, your needs will be met. It's an advice. He says, if you allow me to come in, your yokes will be destroyed. You'll be able to walk out of prison that the enemy has put you into. And doors will begin to open unto you. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 12, verse 1 to 11. Acts 12, from verse 1 to 11. Peter was put in prison by somebody who had killed before who wanted to kill again. And Peter was chained in prison. But the Bible says a light came into the prison. And suddenly, the yokes binding him were, the, the, the chains just dropped off. The enemy fell asleep. If we allow the light to come in. Your enemies will fall asleep. A light came, came in and he walked out of prison. When they got to the gate, the gate opened on their own accord because light came in. He said, let my light come in. And you see that your appointment with death will be cancelled. He said, let me come in. And death would not even be able to stay. Well, we have several examples in the Bible. You have Mark chapter 5, 
from verse 35 to 43. Mark 5, 35 to 43. And there was a girl who was already dead. The light came in and death became ordinary sleep. And say, then he made a, a, a very important statement in Deuteronomy chapter 30 from verse 19 to 20. Deuteronomy 30 verse 19 to 20. He said, I'm placing between you life and death, causes and blessings. He asks you to choose. It's an advice. God won't force you to be saved. He won't force you to surrender your life to Jesus. He said, choose life that you and your children may live. When you take a decision to surrender your life to Jesus, right, that decision will not only affect you, it will affect even your children, including those that are yet to be born. But if you refuse to allow him in, that decision will also affect you. It will affect your children, and it will affect those who are yet to be born. So take his advice today. Surrender your life to Jesus Christ. He will save your soul, and everything will become new. But before you come forward, get this clear. Don't be deceived by those who say that once you give your life to Jesus Christ, you can live any kind of life you want. That's not true. If you are a thief and you say you are born again, you are saying, I will steal no more. If you are a harlot and you are surrendering your life to Jesus Christ, you are saying, Bye-bye to our lottery. If you give your life to Jesus Christ, you become a new creature. You become a child of God. Even those who are not Christian expect you to change. They expect you to behave differently. You probably have heard people say to some people who call themselves Christians when they misbehave, unbelievers will say, but you call yourself a child of God. In other words, they expect things to be different once you give your life to Jesus Christ. So if you want things to be different from now on, that those things you used to do, you don't want to do anymore. You want to become a member of the family of God, which is a family of light. Then come forward now. We will pray to the Almighty God. He will save your soul and everything will become new. I'm going to count from one to ten. Before I say ten, make sure you come and stand before me. I know some of you are far away. So begin to come very, very quickly. Come and surrender your life to him. Open the door of your heart to light. Let light come in and darkness will go out. I'm counting now. One. And please, brethren, this year, if you are not going to clap with all your heart for God, don't clap at all. Whatever is worth doing at all, is worth doing well. If you want to give your life to Jesus, come very quickly. Two. You want the light of God to shine into your life and to get rid of every force of darkness? Come now. Three. Let there be light. Let the light of God shine into your life. Open the door to him. Let light come in. 
and everything will change. He will not come in empty-handed. Every good and perfect gifts, they come from the Father of lights. When he comes in, failure will go out and you will you'll begin to succeed. Come quickly, five. Six. Seven. As for those of you who are clapping, you will have a lot to clap about this year. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, whatever you touch will begin to prosper. Nine. Thank you. Those of you who are still on the way, keep coming and pray as you come. Those of us who are already in front, let's talk to the Almighty God. Ask Him, come into my life, Lord. Bring your light into my life. Save my soul and dwell in me. And I will serve you for the rest of my life. I'm saying bye-bye to a life of darkness. Bye-bye to a life of sin. I will do your will from now on. Call on him and he will save your soul. And the rest of us, please, let's stretch our hands towards these people and intercede for them and pray that the one who saved our own souls will save their souls also. Pray that this very day God will accept them into the family of God, into the family of light. Intercede for them for another one minute or two. And those of you who are still on the way, hurry up. Because I want to pray for salvation now. Hurry up very quickly. This is your day of salvation. Your day of light. Thank you, Father. And those of you who are still on the way, just make sure you get there before I finish praying and you'll still be okay. Keep coming. I can see you. I wait another five seconds for you. But keep coming. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. My Father, my God, I want to bless your holy name. I want to give you all glory and honor for your word. And I want to thank you for these people that have come forward to surrender their life to you. Please, Lord God Almighty, receive them in Jesus' name. Let your blood wash away their sins, save their souls, receive them into the family of light. Don't let them go back into darkness. And from now on, any time they call on you, please answer them by fire. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Now I rejoice with those of you who have come forward to surrender your life to Jesus. I want to promise you, by the grace of God, from now on, I'll be praying for you. So the counselors will give you a card to fill very quickly, because I need to have your names, your address, and your prayer request. 
So as they give you the card, fill it very quickly. Those of you who are still on the way, you, can, you are welcome. Keep coming. The prayer had covered you too. Collect the card, fill, and return. We will wait for you for about three minutes before we proceed. Glory be to God.
because of time, I will leave part of what I plan for tonight till next month, if the Lord tarries. I will go to that section of let there be light. That is a request from you and I to God. Like one of our former speakers told us, the only request of Bartimaeus for his great turnaround was, let there be light. In Matthew 15, from verse 21 to 28, Matthew 15, 21 to 28, when that woman came to Jesus Christ, whose daughter was grievously vexed of the devil, all the woman was asking for was, God, let there be light in my family. If your light shines, darkness will let go of my daughter. If the madman of Gadara had been able to speak before the demons controlling him took over, his request would have been, God, let there be light. Because if there is light, the forces of darkness will lose their hold of me. So our prayers tonight will be fivefold. And I hope you will pay attention to all of them so that when the time comes for you to pray, you will take note of each one. Request number one will be, Father, let your light shine for me. Let your light shine for me. Because if your light shines for me, I will be able to see the invisible. I know that's a bit deep. But if the light of God begins to shine for you, then you begin to see what ordinary eyes cannot see. Second Kings chapter 2, verse 9 to 15. Second Kings 2, 9 to 15. When Elijah was about to depart, and he asked Elisha, what do you want me to do for you before I be taken away from you? He said, I want a double portion of your spirit. He said, you have asked a hard thing. But if you see me when I'm being taken away from you, you will have it. You will have your request. It takes the light of God shining for Elisha to see the horses of fire and the chariots of fire. They are not things to be seen by ordinary eyes. When the light of God shines for you, you begin to see the invisible. And the implications of this is that when all your requests, no matter how hard, will be granted. Because Elijah said to Elisha, you have asked a hard thing. But when the horses of fire and the chariots of fire came to take Elijah away, Elisha saw it. Why? Because the light of God shone for him. And because that light shone for Elisha that day, suddenly his destiny became activated. Because in 1 Kings chapter 19, from verse 19 to 21, 1 Kings 19, from verse 19 to 21, it had been revealed to Elisha 
you are going to become a prophet. That's why he said bye-bye to famine. But he wasn't a prophet until that light shone for him and his eyes opened and he began to see the invisible. We are at the beginning of a new year. We are at the beginning of a new decade. I decree in the name that's above every other name that as the light of God shines for you today, your destiny will be activated. Because until your destiny is activated, you will remain stagnant. The moment the light of God shines for you, that you begin to see the invisible, that you begin to have answer to your hard questions, your promotion becomes accelerated. Maybe I need to explain briefly, when we talk about seeing the invisible, that does not necessarily mean seen angels. I'm sure you know something called vision. When we talk about vision, there's vision physical. I can see you, you can see me, that's physical. Vision is ability to see into future, to see how great you can become, to see how powerful God can make you. When, 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 when a student goes to the medical school, it's because that student has a vision of him becoming a medical doctor. And some, if you ask some of the people in the first class, in, in year one of medical school, what is your vision? You'll be amazed at how different their visions could be one will tell you, I want to become a medical doctor. So what? What do you want to do after that? Well, I want to practice as a doctor. Another will tell you, I don't just want to become a medical doctor. I want to have a big hospital of my own. Vision. When the light of God shines for you, you begin to see greatness ahead of you you begin to see how great you can become. I pray that the Almighty God will let his light shine for you today. <laughs> That's prayer number one. Let your light shine for me. But there is a greater prayer, and that is, let your light shine in me. Shine for me is one. Shine in me is two. When you ask the light of God to shine in you, it means it will open your inner eye. Psalm 119 verse 18. Psalm 119 verse 18. He said, open down my eyes that I may be able to behold wondrous things from your word. You know, two people can read the same passage in the Bible. And one will see just one thing, and other can write a book or just one verse. Because the light is shining in one and not shining in the other. When the light of God is shining in you, you begin to get revelations. Revelations. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, from verse 2 to 7, 2 Corinthians 12, from verse 2 to 7, you, you, you begin to see heavenly things. You begin to see wondrous things. You begin to see things that can be revealed only by God to people. Thank you, Father. 
This word, first word is for me, eh? but I will share it with you. Because God said, there's someone here tonight, he said, I'm going to robe you in light. <laughs> and he said, the light will be so bright, your enemies will not even be able to look in your direction. But when we say, let your light shine, let your light shine in me, it means something else. It means, give me inspiration. You know, it is possible to look at the same thing over and over. It's possible to look at the same thing over and over and not see it. But Ephesians chapter 1 verse 18, Ephesians 1 verse 18 says that the Almighty God can cause the eye of your understanding to be enlightened. When the light of God shines in you, you see solution to problems that will baffle others. I give you just an illustration very quickly. It's a, it's a story I've told you before. But when I was doing my PhD, and I've told you before, you are doing a PhD in mathematics means you are solving a problem that has not been solved before. And because it's a problem that has not been solved before, nobody's even sure it has a solution. And unless you solve that problem, you don't get your PhD. So I've been working on this problem for 18 months. And I ended up with 186 simultaneous equations. Now, if you know anything about mathematics, you know that's a big, big problem. And it got to a stage when I don't know what to do any longer. I don't know how to go forward. And I don't want to go back because that would mean 18 months wasted. Then one night, I was just reading the crossing of the Red Sea. And suddenly, God spoke. Son, bring your equations. And I brought them. And he began to say, put this one on the left, put this one on the right, put this one on the left, put this one on the right. I did what he said. By the time I finished, I suddenly saw that all those on the left had something in common, all those on the right had something in common, and the equation became compressed in five hours. I had finished my thesis. The work I've been laboring on for 18 months was solved in five hours because the light shone into me. I decree to somebody here today, the light of the Most High God will shine into you. And then number three, Number three prayer is that you will pray that God will let his light shine through you. Let the light of God shine through me. I'm sure those of you who know a little bit of science, you will know that the moon has no light of its own. But it takes the light of the sun and reflects it to the earth. And occasionally the 
the light of the moon can be so bright you can even see your fingerprints. It has no light of its own, but light is shining through it to the rest of the world. Let your light shine through me means in your name, you the light of the world, I can cause light to shine to others. For example, Acts chapter 3, verse 1 to 8. Acts chapter 3, verse 1 to 8. There was this man who was born lame, sitting by the beautiful gate, begging for arms. He saw Peter and John coming to the temple, ask for arms. But Peter said, silver and gold are fine now. But I have something that I can give you that money cannot buy. You know, when light begins to shine, stagnation comes to an end. One of the things that maybe we'll have opportunity to discuss in future is this. Suppose you are driving at night. You're driving your car. You're going at top speed. And all of a sudden, the headlamps went out. What will you do? If you love yourself, you stop immediately. Because everywhere is dark. So you don't know where you're going anymore. So you stop immediately. When there is darkness, there is stagnation. Until light comes again, you can't move forward. So when you say, let there be light, it could also mean, Lord, let me begin to make progress. Now, when the light is shining through you, then God can turn you to a vessel unto honor that will put an end to stagnation in the life of others. When the light of God is shining through you, you can even cause other blind eyes to begin to see. For example, in 2 Kings chapter 6, thank you, Father. <sighs> Again, this one is for me, but I will share it with you. You know, the elders have a proverb. I, I will say, I will try and say it in English as, as much as I can before I say it in the original language. It says, the help you are expecting may not necessarily come from your relative, that it is the one that God sends to you that can help you. That's the proverb. In Yoruba, they say, Ajumabi okokanta anu, and Yoluwa baransi nilin she nilore, and that's the way the elders put it. Now, the Lord is saying to someone here today, I will send you a divine encourager. In other words, he's saying, don't look at your relatives for help. I will send you a divine encourager. Now, if the light of God is shining through you, you can also begin to cause others to see the invisible. For example, in 2 Kings chapter 6, from verse 8 to 17, 2 Kings 6, from verse 8 to 17, the Bible tells us about an army that came to arrest Elisha. A whole army came to arrest a man. And the servant of the man of God went out at night, uh, in the morning, and saw the place surrounded by an army. He came inside, frightened, and said, Master, what are we going to do? The master said, Hey, don't be afraid. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. But the boy could only see two of them versus an army. Then the man of God prayed and said, God, open his eyes. Let him begin to see what I'm seeing. I pray for somebody here today 
every one of you who call yourself my children, that vision that God has shown to me, he will show it also to you. The next thing I want you to pray, which will be prayer number three, is that you want that light to shine on your blind spot. Every man has a, po a spot called the blind spot. It's usually at the very back of your, of your head. No matter how hard you try, you can't see it. Even at times when you have to use mirrors, you have to use two to begin to get a glimpse. The blind spot is the weakest spot in any man's life. You cannot see it by yourself. So when you say, Lord, let your light shine into my blind spot, you are saying, God, at that level where I am helpless, send me help. And it doesn't matter how anointed you are, you have a blind spot. If God shines his light to your blind spot, it means that in the area where you are absolutely helpless, he will be there covering it for you. And that is very important. It's important because when you read 2 Samuel chapter 21, from verse 15 to 17, 2 Samuel chapter 21 from verse 15 to 17, the Bible tells us that David, the giant killer, went to war. And when the battle was on, he became faint. And that day, he would have been killed. But somebody came behind to help him. In 1 Kings chapter 19, from verse 4 to 8, 1 Kings 19 from verse 4 to 8, the Bible tells us about Elijah, that mighty man of God who could call down fire from heaven at will. He was running from his enemy. He got to a place where he was tired of running. He was afraid. He was tired. He was hungry. And you know the first, next thing he did? He slept. Can you imagine what would have happened if the enemy had been pursuing? They would have met him sleeping and they would have killed him. But God sent help. He sent an angel who brought him food. And the man who was already contemplating suicide was able to continue his journey successfully. In that area where you are weakest, May the Almighty God send help to you tonight. <laughs> and like the example I mentioned earlier on in Acts chapter 12, from verse 1 to 11, Acts 12, from verse 1 to 11, the Bible tells us about Peter, who was in prison, changed to two soldiers, doors locked against him, the one who was going to kill him was already waiting for the day to come. The light shone into his dark spot. He was sleeping, was helpless. Even if he wasn't sleeping, there was nothing he could do. But help came at the crucial moment. As we go through this year, because like I told those of you who were here at the watch night service, This is going to be a year of shouts of joy. Because it's going to be a year of many victories. Which means it might be a year of many battles. You are going to need help. 
At that time when you can no longer help yourself, may the light of God shine for you. I still remember as yesterday, when we were in the first auditorium near the expressway, we were having, we were not very many then, maybe about 10,000 or so, we were having the convention, everything was going great, uh, the Spirit of God was moving mightily, I was laying hands on people right, left and center. In those days, we we lay hands on everybody who is barren, not very many, everyone who is sick, etc., etc. Et and then, finally, past midnight, I wanted to pray for all the ministers of God present. There were not very many. And suddenly I heard, in the Spirit, one witch on the right, on my right, speaking to another witch on my left, saying, it is time now for us to intervene. I didn't know they were there. I was having fun in the Holy Spirit. I know you asked the question, how can witches be in the church of God? Ah. A good hospital is where you see the worst cases. Wherever the children of God gather, the children of the devil must be there. And you, you don't even know who you are sitting next to. But thank God that there is somebody who can take care of your blind spot. And suddenly God spoke to me and said, Hey son, hold on. Tell the ministers of God to stop. And then he asked me to call those switches forward. You better come out now or you are dead. Nobody thought they would come out, but they came <laughs> because they knew who was speaking. That God who covered my blind spot will take care of your blind spot also in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. I'm about to close, but God has just said something beautiful. Again, it is for me. But I will share it with you also. <laughs> Several years ago, in the 1970s, at the time when tape recorder, you know that tape recorder with cassette, when it was just coming out, very, was very popular all over the world then. An uncle of mine came to me and said, Abro, I'm traveling abroad. I said, yes, sir. What do you want me to bring you? He said, you have a choice. A pair of shoes, a suit, or a tape recorder. Ah. At that time, I had only two pairs of shoes. So a pair of shoes is uh, attractive. At that time, I think I had two suits. Another suit will be welcome. And yet I want a tape recorder. Ah, I looked at my uncle, I said, Sir, do I have to choose? He laughed and he left. When he returned, he brought me a pair of shoes, he brought me a suit, and he brought me a tape recorder. Now, I'm telling you that story because the Lord said there is someone here tonight that very soon somebody is going to give you three big offers. And ask you to choose one. He asked me to tell you your answer should be all of the above. I told you that is for me, not, not for everybody. Finally, your prayer number five should be that God will shine his light on whatever is hindering 
your little light from shining. Because you already have some light. He had already said you are the light of the world. But at times, there could be light covered. There could be something covering your light from shining. If he shines his light or what is covering your light, then your light will begin to shine brightly. Joshua chapter 7. You can read it from verse 1 to the end. Joshua 7 from verse 1 to the end. The Almighty God himself had told Joshua, nobody will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. That's what God told Joshua. It was God who said so. They had shouted one big hallelujah. I don't know which of the three kind of hallelujah it was that they shouted that day, whether it's the jumpolistic <laughs> or the other one. They had shouted and the wall had come down. And then they came across a little city called Ai. And they were defeated. Suddenly, the light of Joshua that was shining became dark. He fell on his face and began to cry to God, this is not what you promised me was happening. And God shone his light on the cause of failure. Some of us are where we are today because there's something covering our light. I pray in the name that's above every other name that whatever it is will be removed tonight in Jesus' name. I don't have time to tell you story upon stories, but there are people who are highly gifted, people with the ability to succeed, but something is covering their light from shining. Maybe I just tell you one of the one of the examples. There was this this fellow who had PhD in agriculture or something. And with that PhD, he couldn't get a job. And I'm talking of in the 19, early 1980s when PhD was still very precious. He couldn't get a job. And because he couldn't get a job, of course, he couldn't get a wife, etc., etc. Et and then he came. He gave his life to Jesus Christ. We prayed. And the Almighty God moved. Between Lagos and his hometown, because the light of God has shown, he got a job. The job was waiting for him at home. Within six months, he was married. I tell you about three months later. In a year, within one year, he got a job, he got married, and he got a set of twins. All in one year. Because what was covering his light was removed. Whatever is covering your glory that is not allowing it to shine, whatever is covering the goodness and mercy of God that's already embedded in you will be removed tonight in Jesus' name. So you are going to pray five prayers. Prayer number one. Lord, let your light shine for me. That's the first one. Let your light shine for me. Number two, let your light shine in me. Let it shine into me. Number three, let your light shine through me. Number four, let your light shine upon my blind spot. 
send me help where I am absolutely helpless. And number five, anything that is covering my light from shining, shine your light upon it so it can be removed so that my light can continue to shine. Like someone said, or like I think I mentioned to my pastors while they were praying, we are not only at the beginning of a new year, we are at the beginning of a new decade. Whatever happens to you this year is going to determine what happens to you in the next 10 years. It's as serious as that. So the prayer you pray tonight, if you like, pray it casually. If you like, pray it with all your heart. It's not this year alone now that is at stake. It is a decade that is at, at stake. Let your light shine for me. Let your light shine into me. Let your light shine through me. Let your light shine on my blind spot. And let your light shine on everything that has been covering my light so that it can be removed. The altar is open. I'm going to give you uh, quite a few minutes to cry unto the Almighty God so that the light can shine. Lord, let there be light. Let your light shine for me. Let your light shine in me. Let your light shine through me. Let your light shine on my blind spot. And Lord God Almighty, let your light shine on whatever it is that has been blocking my light from shining. Let's cry unto the Almighty God. Of course, you start by thanking Him again for even bringing you here tonight. Let your light shine. My Father, my God, let your light shine.
Two o'clock. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. The light of the Most High God will shine for you. It will shine for your family. Everyone who is precious to you, the light will shine for them. The light of God will shine in you. It will show you the way out. It will show you the easiest way to solve your problem. It will inspire you. The light of God will shine through you. Beginning from now, through you, miracles will happen. The sick will be healed. Captives will be set free. God will use you to raise the dead. His light will shine through you. In all those areas where there's nothing you can do to help yourself, He will send help to you. His light will shine on your blind spot. And everything that is covering your light from shining, this very night, God will remove them. So shall it be. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. Well, God bless you. Let's go back to our seats. For the next few minutes, the ministers of God will want to pray with you, a prayer of agreement. So let's get back to our seat very quickly, please, so that we can proceed. God bless you. The ministers of God who have been praying along with us will come and lay hands on on you as a prayer of agreement. They will just touch you very briefly because it is written if two of you shall agree as touching anything that they shall ask on earth, it will be done for them by our Father in heaven. The beginning of the year that happens to be the beginning of a decade, particularly when that year is a leap year, is too crucial a, a night to be treated lightly. So the AGOs who help me lay hands on those who are on the altar, the pastors who have prayed with us, you please take your position before the people and kindly do so now because time is, is gone. And then while the band is playing worshiping God so that the anointing will keep flowing and people will come forward and we lay hands on them and then they go back to their seats 
Before then, we we'll thank the Almighty God. And uh, I might briefly share what God says is going to, what we can expect in the new year, just in case you don't know them already before we go. So pastors, will you please take your position? And uh, band, will you please begin to worship God for us? Okay. God bless you pastors, let's move fast. Let the light shine through you as you lay hands on the people in agreement. You can start.
Let somebody shout hallelujah. I'm in total agreement with every one of you that your requests be granted. I'm in total agreement with you that before the end of this month, it will be evident that the light of God is shining for you. So shall it be in Jesus' name. Now, if you are still there and they have not yet laid hands on you, I, I think they are see a few pastors there waiting, but then you have to come quickly now. Now, um, just one or two little words about what God said is likely to happen this year. Now, anytime God says something is going to happen, particularly those that might not sound too nice, it is to invite us to prayer. Prayer can change things. On the international scene, this year, uh, and when we talk about international scene, that includes all nations of the world. Please help those people who are clapping. The Bible says, the, I mean, the Lord says, the, the world this year will be the earth will behave like a convulsing child. A child going through convulsion. Physically, he says, there will be earthquakes. <clears throat> In places where they have never even occurred before. Which is why you need to pray. It says the fire, the flood that we saw in 2019 uh, is child's play compared to what is coming this year. And that's frightening. That's the reason why we need to pray, particularly for nations like Nigeria. Because if... Uh, if we look at the prophecy for last year for international sea, help them, engineer, you can hear those people clapping. Help them. Included in the Bible passage or passages I gave you for the prophecy for the international sea, because last year we gave the prophecy in coded form because of some interesting people who are just waiting to see how they can catch and twist whatever we said. And if we go through the Bible passages for international sin, last year you see fire and flood. Now, if nations like Australia, and America, as advanced as they are, are having problems dealing with fire, then we need to pray that that will not happen in Nigeria. <laughs> because we don't, we don't even have the equipment. We don't have the wherewithal to handle something massive. The little flood that we saw last year in Nigeria, you could see the devastating effects on villages and towns. So if God says what happened in 2019 is child's play compared to 2020, we need to pray. 
Then he, he, he said there will be on the political scene, there will be change of governments. Now, don't say that I said that there will be a change of government in Nigeria. That's not what I said. I said on the international scene. Mm -hmm. There will be change of governments. And he said some of it will be peaceful. And some will not be so peaceful. But if we pray, God is able to change things. Uh, on the individual level, he said it will be a year of joy, shouts of joy. That's for Christians. Series of joy, he says. Because he said there will be series of victories. And like I explained to you on the watch night service, victories means or implies battles. You, you don't talk of victory until you have fought battles. So there will be battles, but there will be victories. So there will be joy. And he emphasized for those of us who are children of God, don't be afraid. He said that again and again and again. And he said, because the battle is not yours. The battle is not yours. Don't be afraid. And if there's any battle, and you know you are going to win even before the battle, I think you should be rejoicing. So, those of us who know we are going to shout for joy in the coming year, let me hear you shout hallelujah. <laughs> and when I say coming year, I'm, I'm trying to say from this moment onward, you will be shouting for, for joy. Okay, and then he says, he will answer prayers. He will answer prayers this year. Okay, now, uh, I think that's about all I'm allowed to tell you. Uh, just don't worry, the battle is not yours, and we are going to win. Amen? Mm -hmm. So there will be victories, whatever the battles may be. And the battle is not ours. Um, I was discussing with some of my children the other day. I said, as a boxer, if you know you are going to win every fight, you're a champion, you know you are going to win every fight, and then you say, let there be fights. Because every fight will lead to a victory. Victory will lead to prosperity. And so you keep on saying, let them bring the fight. I remember I preached a sermon several years ago called, Let the Lion Come. How many of you are more than conquerors? How many of you will say, let the, let the fight begin? Because we are going to win. And then let me hear you shout hallelujah. <laughs> there is this little a message from a friend of mine that I think I should share briefly with you. <clears throat> I'm sure you know that friend of mine. How many of you know him? What kind of friend is he? He's a mathematician, all right. <laughs> Some of you know him. He's a mathematician friend of mine. He's a very, very funny fellow. Uh, he, he tries to reduce everything to mathematics. So the other day we were talking about uh, some situations and, and he suddenly began to talk about uh, uh, Newton's second law of motion. Those of you who are scientists, you know what that law is. That law says action and reaction are equal and opposite. 
So he, he began to say that uh, we all know that the opposite of up is down, the opposite of uh, good is bad, and, uh, and the ideas of very funny things, the opposite of election is impeachment, the opposite of uh, hate is love, etc., etc. Then he reached a conclusion. He said, the only way to conquer hate is by love, not by law. Do you agree with him? Uh, so he asked me to say, Happy New Year to you. <laughs> Let somebody shout hallelujah. It's time to say thank you to Jesus Christ. <laughs> So let's take our Thanksgiving offering and with joy you, you dance to the nearest basket, you drop your offering and I pronounce a blessing on you and you'll be on your way. And the uh, ministers of God, you too can go from the altar and be on your way too. So thank you, uh, Band. You have been doing a very nice job. You will continue to do a very nice job. Let's take our Thanksgiving offering and dance to the nearest basket. God bless you, ushers. You did a very great job last year. You will do a greater one this year. Thank you, Father. Ah, hold on, hold on. <laughs> Daddy says there's someone here tonight. It must be me. He said, because of you, your friends will get miracles this year. Yeah. He says, as for you, you will get wonders. Yeah. Amen. Okay, now, you can begin to sing. All thanks we give to you, Lord. All thanks we give to you, Lord. All thanks we give to you, Lord. We give to you, Lord. We give to you, Lord. All thanks we give to you, Lord. We give to you, Lord.
Father, we say thank you once again. Thank you for speaking to our future. Father, we look forward to miracles for our friends. And we look forward to wonders for ourselves. Accept our thanks in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray that this year will be extremely successful for your children. That your light will shine into them. And shine into their finances. I pray that this year your children will not borrow. But they will have more than sufficient. Bless their offering, Lord. Sanctify it. Use it for your glory. And Father, I pray that long before the end of this month, your children will already be shouting for joy. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Who oh got the biggest miracle tonight? Let your hallelujah be the loudest. 